Antarctica is unlike any other place on Earth. It is colder, drier, and windier than anywhere else, and almost the entire continent is buried under ice that's miles thick. For most of human history, it was a blank spot on the map. No one even saw it until 1820, and no one set foot on it until 1895. Today it might seem impossible that people live there at all, yet thousands of scientists and support staff spend months, sometimes even years, on this frozen frontier. They face months of darkness, violent storms, and complete isolation from the rest of the world. But why do they go there? How do they get there? And what does it take to survive in a place this extreme? In this video, we'll look at the reality of life in Antarctica, how the continent is governed, how people reach it, and what it takes to keep things running at the bottom of the world. Living in Antarctica isn't just a test of endurance. It's a massive logistical operation that requires planning on a scale few other places can match. Most people are surprised to learn that no single country owns Antarctica. It's one of the very few places on Earth without an official government. Seven countries, Chile, Argentina, the United Kingdom, Norway, Australia, France, and New Zealand have all laid claim to different slices of the continent. But here's the catch. Most of these claims aren't recognized by the rest of the world. Think about it. If no one really owns Antarctica, then who makes the rules? This question became more urgent in the late 1950s when several nations were building bases there and tensions were rising. The Cold War was heating up and the United States and the Soviet Union both had an interest in Antarctica. Instead of letting it turn into another political flashpoint, countries came together to create the Antarctic Treaty signed in 1959. The treaty was groundbreaking. It banned military activity, nuclear testing, and mining. It also made Antarctica a place only for peaceful purposes and scientific research. But here's the twist. The treaty deliberately avoided settling the territorial disputes. It basically said, nothing contained in the present treaty shall be interpreted as a renunciation by any contracting party of previously asserted rights of or claims to territorial sovereignty in Antarctica. That's why, even today, Antarctica is treated as an international zone, like the high seas or outer space. Imagine what would happen if the ice melted and massive resources were exposed. Would these countries still play nice? Or would we finally see a fight for control over the last untouched continent? If Antarctica has no cities, no native population, and almost no infrastructure, why do thousands of people travel there every year? The answer is science. Almost everyone who lives in Antarctica is a scientist or part of a support crew helping scientists do their work. This frozen continent is like a giant time capsule. Ice cores drilled from its glaciers can reveal what Earth's climate was like hundreds of thousands of years ago. Studying them tells us how carbon levels, temperature, and sea levels have changed over time. There are also lakes buried deep under the ice that may hold microbial life forms that have been isolated for millions of years. Life that could give clues about how organisms survive in extreme environments, even on other planets. And it's not just about Earth, because Antarctica has almost no light pollution and very low background radiation. It's one of the best places in the world to study outer space. Astronomers can use high-tech instruments to look deeper into the universe than almost anywhere else on the planet. The science done here is expensive and risky, but it's research that can't be done anywhere else. Without Antarctica, we wouldn't understand the past or predict our planet's future. Reaching Antarctica is far from easy. It's not like booking a flight to another country. There are no commercial airports, no regular airlines, and no cities waiting at the other end. Most flights leave from Christchurch in New Zealand, though there are also departures from Cape Town in South Africa, Punta Arenas in Chile, and Hobart in Australia. 
The trip to McMurdo Station, the main logistics hub, takes about five hours from New Zealand. Large cargo planes like the C-17 Globemaster carry people and supplies to the continent. They land on special runways, some made of compacted snow, others on dense blue ice. Both can handle the weight of heavy aircraft. From McMurdo, getting to remote bases like the Amundsen Scott South Pole Station usually requires smaller LC-130 aircraft, which have retractable skis to land on snow and ice. Scott Base, New Zealand's research station, is located just three miles from McMurdo and is accessed the same way by LC-130 or overland travel. In summer, Scott Base hosts around 60 staff. In winter, it's down to about 10 to 12 people, mostly researchers and technicians. Flights to Antarctica follow strict safety rules. Every plane leaving New Zealand, Australia, South Africa, and Chile must carry enough fuel to reach Antarctica, attempt a landing, and then return to its origin if landing is impossible because there are no alternate airports to divert to. Equipment fails, weather changes suddenly, and visibility can drop to zero. To limit risks, planes are not allowed to land or take off in darkness. Since the Antarctic winter brings 24 hours of night for months, flights stop completely once winter sets in. And here's something most people don't know. There's actually a road across Antarctica. The South Pole Traverse is a 995-mile snow road used by tractor convoys that drag sleds loaded with cargo. The trip takes around 40 days one way, but it's cheaper than flying and can move much heavier loads. Even with runways, convoys, and planes, Antarctica is unpredictable. A single storm can shut everything down for weeks, and once winter begins, the entire continent becomes completely cut off. Antarctica isn't just cold, it's brutally cold. At the South Pole, the warmest temperature ever recorded is just 10 degrees Fahrenheit. And in the middle of winter, it can drop to minus 70 degrees Fahrenheit. On the coast, summer days might barely reach freezing. During the long winter months, the continent is in total darkness for up to six months straight. With no sunlight, flights and ships stop completely. Once the last plane leaves in February, the people staying behind are cut off until November. At South Pole Station, only about 45 people stay through the winter. They spend months in isolation, with no way out and no chance for resupply. Every bit of food, fuel, and equipment they will need has to be brought in long before the last plane departs. Emergencies do happen. There have been a handful of dangerous winter evacuations, but they're extremely risky. The weather is so cold that even jet fuel can freeze solid in minutes. Emergencies aren't just a theoretical risk. They've happened even in recent years. In August 2025, the Royal New Zealand Air Force carried out one of the most difficult operations in Antarctic history, a midwinter medical evacuation from McMurdo Station. Three U.S. staff members required urgent medical attention, one critically. A New Zealand Air Force's C-130. Hercules flew nearly 20 hours round trip from Christchurch, navigating total darkness and minus 11 degrees Fahrenheit temperatures. The crew had to land on Phoenix Airfield's ice runway using night vision goggles, keep engines running during refueling to stop them from freezing, and then fly the patients back to New Zealand. It showed just how extreme and high-risk medical logistics are in Antarctica, and why wintering over is never taken lightly. Antarctica is unique because no single country owns it. But with valuable resources under the ice and so many nations interested in the continent, rules had to be made. That's where the Antarctic Treaty comes in. It was signed in 1959 by the United States, the Soviet Union, and 10 other countries, 
Today, over 50 nations have agreed to it. The treaty bans military bases, weapons testing, and mining. It ensures that Antarctica is used only for peaceful purposes and scientific research. But here's the part that often surprises people. The treaty did not decide who owns what. Countries like Chile, Argentina, the UK, Australia, and Norway still have territorial claims, but the treaty simply froze those disputes. Everyone agreed to stop arguing and focus on science instead. But what happens if, one day, nations start fighting over Antarctica's resources? Could the treaty collapse? For now, it works, but the future is uncertain. Keeping people alive and bases running in Antarctica is a massive logistical challenge. Almost everything, food, fuel, building materials, scientific equipment, has to be shipped or flown in. During the summer, cargo ships can reach the coast once the sea ice breaks up. These ships unload at McMurdo Station, which acts as the main supply hub. From there, supplies are distributed to other stations. Large cargo planes like the C-17 Globemaster carry both passengers and equipment. For inland travel, smaller LC-130 aircraft with skis deliver supplies to remote bases. To reduce costs, there's even a 995-mile overland snow road called the South Pole Traverse. Tractor convoys take about 40 days to haul sleds loaded with cargo from McMurdo to the South Pole Station. It's slow, but it allows much heavier loads than planes. Everything has to be planned months ahead. Once winter arrives, no flights or ships can come in for over half the year. Bases must stockpile fuel and food well before the last plane leaves. One mistake in planning could mean running out of vital supplies, and in Antarctica, that could be deadly. The entire system depends on perfect timing and coordination. Spending months in Antarctica isn't just about surviving the cold. It's about coping with extreme isolation. At places like South Pole Station, about 45 people stay through the winter. Once the last plane leaves, they know they won't see another flight for seven months. Day-to-day -day life revolves around keeping the station running, maintaining power, heat, communications, and performing scientific work. Everyone has a role, from engineers to mechanics, cooks, and researchers. But the psychological challenge is just as tough as the physical one. For half the year, it's 24 hours of darkness. The same small group of people eat every meal together, see the same surroundings, and live cut off from the rest of the world. There are no emergency exits. If someone gets seriously sick or injured, help is thousands of miles and months away. It's one of the few places on Earth where people are truly cut off from civilization for more than half the year, more isolated than astronauts on the International Space Station. Antarctica might seem like a frozen wasteland, but it's one of the most important places on Earth. Its ice sheets hold most of the world's fresh water. If they melted completely, Sea levels would rise by more than 200 feet, flooding major cities worldwide. In recent years, scientists have sounded alarms as Antarctic sea ice has reached record lows and ice shelves have shown signs of accelerated melting. What happens here will shape coastlines around the world. Antarctica is also a natural laboratory. The research done there helps us understand climate change, past atmospheric conditions, and even how life might survive on other planets. There have been small steps toward renewable energy at Antarctic stations. Solar panels and wind turbines now provide part of the power at some bases. At the same time, tourism has increased, with more seasonal cruises and charter flights bringing visitors to the continent, raising new questions about environmental impact. Politically, the Antarctic Treaty still keeps the peace, but as natural resources become more valuable, the question remains, how long will nations keep cooperating?
Antarctica is one of the harshest, most unforgiving places on the planet. It takes months of planning, complex logistics, and an incredible amount of human effort just to keep a few thousand people alive there each summer, and far fewer in the dark, brutal winter months. Yet the work done on this icy frontier shapes our understanding of Earth's past and its future. If you found this video interesting, like, subscribe, and check out other documentaries on the channel. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.